mai ka piina ka lai hai hai a ai ka velulo aku ka molu ole hua from where the sun rises a high high in the east to where it sets at the pleasant taproot of Lehua. Aloha Pumihana Kako. Warm greetings to all of you. My name is Benton Kelly Pang. Um, what I'm presenting you today is a glimpse of my uh, doctoral dissertation. Um, I, was, I'm a, I was a student at the University of Hawaii in the botany department. I received my master's and PhD under the supervision of Dr. Isabella Abbott a well-known uh, phycologist, as well as an ethnobotanist. So I really wanted to learn more about how Hawaiians interacted with their environment, as well as how they utilized their forest resources for their culture. So um, what I'll be sharing with you today is a little bit about you know, some of the dissertation work I did in North Kona on the island of Hawaii. Um, I'll also mention that if Dr. Abbott were still alive today, in June would be her centennial year. And um, give a plug that from this June to next year's June, there'll be a number of events uh, dedicated to Dr. Abbott. Um, there'll be events promoting uh, the removal of invasive limu, invasive algae, um, as well as um, talks about um, ethnobotany. Um, one of the uh, large events we hope to have is Bishop Museum will republish. Lao, Lao Hawaii, which has been out of print for at least the past five to ten years. So we look forward to that republication of, of her book. And you can read in her book some of what I'll be talking to you about today. Um, so I'll, I'll be talking mainly about the use of forest resources um, for the making of uh, double hole canoes. The double hole canoes were the primary means of transportation between islands especially by Kamehameha in, in going to Maui and Oahu. Um, and I'll also talk about kauhale, the various plants used in making houses and the types of houses because Hawaii in training his men to go to the other islands, he had to house them and feed them. And so the kauhale, the Hawaiian house and all different types of houses were also very important. But making those houses, making those canoes had an impact on the force. Um, we know from observations that in 1779, 1,000 canoes uh, greeted the HMS Discovery in Kealakikua Bay. Some of these were double-holed. Uh, this is uh, Herb Connie's rendition um, of the disco Discovery in Kealakikua Bay, and we see some double-hole canoes as well as some outrigger canoes. Um, but it was, it was um, thought to number about 1,000 of them. It was also observed that some of the double-hole canoes were nearly as large as the discovery, okay? So they were not small in any means. We also know from historic um, documentation that Kamehameha's naval fleet uh, consisted of at least 10,000 warriors. And he had a fleet divided into four divisions, each of them having 300 canoes, so it's about 1,500 total canoes. And these, again, would be outrigger type of canoes as well as double hull canoes. What I found in my research is that Kamehameha um, received 150 double hull canoes from Kalanio Pu'u, and he also made 150 additional canoes. So the two areas I'll be focusing on are in uh, North Kona and South Kohala. So North Kona, my study site was in Ka'upulehu, where many of the dry forest species used to make um, the Hawaiian hale, and some of the parts of the canoe were gathered from. And Kauai Hai, um, I think Dr. Sam Gon last week talked about Pu'u Kohola, so you know the significance of Pu'u Kohola to Kamehameha. Uh, this is probably one of the main areas where he houses men to train them before they went on to Maui and, and Oahu. A close-up of North Kona, um, Kiholo Bay, and this is the 1800 lava flow and 1801 lava flow. I, I put this in here because in, uh, this is all from the uh, Mount Hula Lai. The 1801 lava flow covered a large fish pond of Kamehameha called Pa'aea. By the 1790s, Kamehameha uh, commanded the construction of a new canoe made of traditional materials and European elements of design and warfare to go to Kauai. 
and this is known as the Peleliu Fleet. So these were um, thought to be very deep. They were also wide and large. Um, some descriptions I have here, they were called monstrosities because it was sort of a hybrid between European design and traditional Hawaiian design. Um, and then some looked to have a type of European sail, a type of European decking, and actually a rudder too, which was not normally uh, found. So again, um, this is Herb Connie's rendition of what the Peleliu may have looked like. The traditional Hawaiian canoe has a more deeply shaped crab claw type of sail. Um, this is more squared off. And at the front here, you see some attached cannons. Okay, so this is um, a rendition of what the Peleliu may have looked like. So trees from Hilo, Ka'u, South Kona were used in, in making um, double hole canoes like the Peleliu. Um, however, the Peleliu never made it to Kauai. Um, there's a storm and a lot of his men actually contracted cholera. So um, Kauai was never quote unquote conquered by Kamehameha. And people from Kauai always like to remind people of, Kame of Kamehameha line about that. Oh, so thank you. Um, so the, the Peleliu actually never, never saw battle on Kauai. Um, this is uh, the parts of a canoe. I'll just highlight a few here. The sort of triangular crab shape type of uh, sail, which is um, Hawaiian. The fact they're one piece dug out um, holes from koa wood is also uniquely Hawaiian. The gunnels, the top part, so the bottom part is, is koa. The top part would be usually of a wood called ahakea. Um, connecting the, the two um, parts would be um, uh, what's called iako. And that sometimes would be used a, a more hard hardwood, maybe like a, a, a sandalwood. The mass would be ohilehua. Um, sorry, yeah, the, the standing mass would be ohilehua. The, the, the mass itself would be lauhala. So um, the general parts of, of the canoe. So which, what parts of the trees were utilized and what species? Um, so I had estimated based upon um, what I knew went into the building of a canoe, the different, par the different parts of the canoe, the trunk or the stem, which was used, and then what part of the canoe, whether it was part of the hull, the, the front part, the seats, the gunnel, um, and then what species were used, the approximate length that was needed, and the diameter that was needed. So the, the largest uh, parts were, were probably the, the koa, and um, unfortunately, today in North Kona, um, there are no large koa trees. And so what I uh, hypothesized was that the koa trees were probably gathered from South Kona, where there would have been, would have been large um, trees of koa, and they could have been um, brought up uh, by water um, to Kauai High to be hewn into double hull canoes. Um, most of the other resources could be found in um, the North Kona area, the, the Ohia Lehua, the Lama, um, <coughs> Sound of wood. So this is for the double hole canoe. Um, other parts of, of the canoe, this is a picture of a uh, llama in the dry forest and the straight trunk of a tall ohe lehua tree and the red lehua blossoms. Um, the number of uh, trunks that may have been needed for, for constructing um, a canoe. So quite a number of, um, this all had some impact on, on the forest in the North Kona, South Kohala area. Show you some photos of uh, a large koa tree here. Here's a person in here for scale. So this would have been the type that um, Kamehameha would have found more plentiful in his time, late 1700s. However, today we don't see um, them around. Um, the, the phyllodes or the expanded leaf petioles of the, the koa tree with uh, some seeds, and then the perspective of the type of koa trees that would have been used for these large double hole canoes. Yeah, question. I'm wondering how long those canoes were. The, the canoes, I think I had them, they're anywhere, usually about 20 meters, 60 feet. So, 
So that's double hole canoes and sort of the use of forest resources. Now let's look at the, the compound of houses that were needed. Again, these were needed to feed the men where they slept and then probably in, in, in the, probably the afternoon time and maybe sometimes into the night, there would be some type of training um, for, for, for the men. So Kauhale is a, a collection of houses and the Kauhale were, um, were usually uh, part of a chief's compound. So a chief would um, have many houses built around him and then that would house all his men as well as his helpers, his tenant, tenants, and some of the lesser chiefs. Kamehameha had many Kauhale and um, if you haven't seen what a, a Hawaiian, grass Hawaiian house looks like, this is generally what we're looking for, but they're of different sizes and definitely different functions. There would be a canoe house. This is where they would this is usually open air. Um, here's the artist rendition of a canoe house. They're usually um, built along the coast. And this is where a lot of the woodworking for making the canoe would be done. There'd be a storage house, and this would be used to store weapons, the um, ahuula, the feathered capes, could be also used to skip store the, the eating um, uh, calabashes. There's men and women ate separately, so there's a place for the men to eat and a place for the women and children to eat. And also there's the, the halepe'e or the menstruation hut. So women were separated from the rest of the, the population in, in the menstruation hut. Uh, so the main parts of a Hawaiian house, the, the main posts, the ridge posts, um, thatching purlins would go horizontal across, and these are all uh, generally different species and uh, of different sizes. So this is a picture uh, looking at the inside of a Hawaiian house. You see some of the, um, the thatching poles, um, and it's, it's tied onto those thatching poles. Here's a view from the outside, uh, again, of the ridge posts, the, the peely grass, and another version of the main, main post, main ridge post here, some uh, roof uh, rafter posts here. When I look at Weber's drawings, they, they don't show the wall coming down like that. It, 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 the roof just seems to go off into the, into the ground. Um, so it, it probably depended upon the function um, of the house how far down that wall would gone. You know, the, the canoe house generally did, didn't even have a wall. It was actually open air. Um, some could have been three-sided. So uh, what goes into uh, making a, a Hawaiian house? Um, generally, you would need four corner posts and use, use various species. The uyuhi and the kawila today are endangered hardwoods. Um, mamane is another one. These are usually three, three meters in length um, and fairly, fairly large in diameter. Um, those are the corner posts. The two main ridge posts, these are in the middle of the house. This is predominantly ohile hua, um, greater than four meters and also fairly large in diameter. Uh, the ridge posts, a little bit, um, you could use nayo, but ohile hua was preferred. These were longer. Um, and then you would have your side posts, the rafters, and then the thatching poles, all utilizing different species of different lengths and of different diameters. And all of these could be collected generally in the, in the North Kona area. Yes? Did Kamehameha Sweet carry these with them from Kauai to Maui to Hawaii? No, no. He, so these Kauhale would have been built in the Kauai High area for his men and for training before they went to the neighbor islands. Yeah, so um, he could have, uh, maybe some of the lesser chiefs could have, when they um, gained control of that island, could have built more kauhale on those islands, but um, they would have been collected from, from the area to make the kauhale. So, yeah, so, so um, my point is that these were not taken to neighbor islands, they were actually built, they were, they were gathered from the north corner kauhale forest, built there in, probably in the north corner Kauai High area for Kamehameha and, and the warriors that he was training before venturing off to the neighbor islands. 
So I found that all the species, except for um, Nayo and Pili, which could be found in the lowlands, were found in the dry forest of uh, North Conan. And this is, um, this is the area where it's right above uh, Mamaloho Highway. Um, and then Ralph had asked me earlier, you know, how long does it take some of these tree species to grow? It takes about 20 years for a coral to grow 20 meters. Um, and that's, um, that's approximately the size that, that um, you would need for, for the, uh, the double hole canoe. Um, it takes a lot longer for Kawila and Uiuhi to get to significant size for either house rafters or for the weapons like the ihe, um, the spears. And there's some pictures of, of the plants. So Aali'i here, these are generally shrubs, but you would look for uh, more straight stems and these could be used for the, the thatching poles which you tie the pili onto. Um, Mamane can actually get quite tall and quite straight. Um, you could use this for uh, the corner posts. Um, and this is the mamani bird feeding off the mamani seeds. It's preferred um, uh, food. And then sandalwood. Um, sandalwood was also utilized. And here's a picture of some of the, the fruits and flowers. Um, the sandalwood was utilized for making parts of the canoe as well as the house. Um, and, and all this had some type of impact on the, on the dry forest. However, it was the, probably the sandalwood trade which happened um, later that probably really did in a lot of the sandalwood trees, sandalwood forests in the South Kohala area and also maybe in, in the North Kona area of Hawaii Island. Um, today, dry forests um, are uh, critically endangered, not necessarily due to the collection by Kamehameha, uh, during the late 1790s, but actually due to introduction of ranching and introduced grasses, which uh, caused fires. So we've lost more of our dry forest probably to introduce grasses and fires as well as ranching practices. Although it should be recognized that Kamehameha, um, Kamehameha did have an impact in the dry forest in North Kona um, during this time. Um, so Ka'upalehu is my, was my study site. Um, I will also mention that um, a big mahalo to Hannah Kihalani Springer, some of you know her. She was the one who inspired me to, to study in Ka'upalehu. She is actually from the land there. She calls herself Kama'aina, child of the land from Ka'upalehu. And uh, it was wonderful working with her um, and uh, the landowner, Kamehameha Schools, and, and being able to study in um, the Ka'upalehu forest. Um, this is uh, thought to be where Kawila uh, once existed um, in, in prehistoric periods. Now today it's critically endangered. This is the bark of Kawila. Um, these are some of the probably the last remaining tall trees of, of Kawila in North Kona. And a picture of the leaves and has tiny little, tiny little flowers. Um, but unfortunately it's, it's endangered today. This is the preferred tree of um, making weapons. It has a very dense hardwood. It's the type of wood that we actually, if you cut a piece of it, it sinks in water. Um, this and Uhi Uhi, another native hardwood trees, um, unfortunately also endangered, were the preferred woods of um, uh, Hawaiian warriors for their weapons. This is a picture of the flowers of Uhi Uhi. It's in the um, uh, bean family. And here's a picture of some folks looking at a, um, an uhi uhi tree. And um, sort of modern weapons, uh, a shark's tooth weapon. And in ancient times, this would have been uh, made of kawila or uhi uhi, very dense. So when you, you know, throw it or you go towards an opponent, it's going to have a lot of weight behind it and, and easily can disembowel your opponent. Um, this is a, a log that has not been made into a weapon at the Bishop Museum. Um, so you see, that's a very nice, uh, pretty kind of uh, dark wood. This is aged, but um, it is, has a generally darker wood than koa. Um, so in, in conclusion, that, you know, collecting from the dry forest of North Kona, um, probably aided in the success of Kamehameha in building all the hale that we need to house his men, feed his men, so he can train his men in Kauai Hai, also to build the number of canoes he needed to go on to the neighbor islands, to Maui and, and Oahu predominantly. Um, 
those forest resources you know, were available to him right there in, in North Kona. Um, and I found in my research that almost all the species he needed were gathered from the North Kona proper, except for the koa trees, which were probably brought up by ship uh, from, from South Kona. Um, and, I, and I say here that koa could have been gathered from South Kona as well as Pu'uva'ava'a. Um, a picture of Kamehameha. And this, this comes from the gates of Iwalani Palace. If you've ever gone to Iwalani Palace, you'll see these two, two individuals here. And they have a, I put, it, put this here because they have actually a, a, a place in this um, history. Um, Kamanava and Kame'eyamoku um, had, had the first contact of foreigners and they actually um, took over um, the ship called the Fair American in the late 1700s. And what happened with that is that when they took over the ship, they were able to get all the artillery, the, the guns, the men of course, but the guns and the cannons from the Fair American. And that's what inspired Kamehameha to build the Peleliu fleet. Also, Kamenawa and Kamehameha were counselors to Kamehameha, and also they owned the Kikaha lands, the, uh, the North Kona lands were, were owned by these two men. And as being counselors to Kamehameha, they too helped Kamehameha in, in commanding men to go out into the forest, collect the trees for the high chief Kamehameha, um, and also as advisors help Kamehameha utilize um, foreign um, ingenuity um, in building the Peleliu. Um, what else did I want to say? Oh, uh, I think it was Isaac Young was also on the Fair American. He also became, along with John Davis, became counselors. Isaac Davis. I, I, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. I knew I got it wrong. Those two men, one of them um, came from the Fair American, and, and the two of them were, were, were um, counselors to Kamehameha, um, also helped Kamehameha in having a more, quote unquote, modern um, warfare. Um, one last thing I'll, I'll talk about. In, um, when Kamehameha, uh, when um, Captain Cook in Kealakekua was killed, um, it was due to a dispute. Some, some uh, Hawaiians had gone on to a ship and um, taken some, some property um, I, thought, I think they may have taken some of the small, um, smaller boats that belonged to the larger ship um, and caused you know, quite a, a conflict and you know, some people died and most notably um, Captain Cook. Um, but I always like to point out that the Hawaiians were not taken from the ship because maybe not that the they didn't need the ships per se because they could build canoes as large as Captain Cook's ships and their outward canoes were probably faster than, than the rowboats that, that they had. What they were probably more interested in was the metal nail. And the metal nail, and this will be maybe a, a future talk, the metal nail has a significant part in Hawaiian cultural traditions, traditions with kapa, Hawaiian bark cloth making. I talked about kawila and uhi uhi, very dense hardwoods. That was the predominant wood used in making, beating the kapa, again, because very dense. But in able to carve the intricate designs, these chevrons, these shark tooth designs into that hard wood, they utilized either obsidian or shark's tooth. When they found the metal nail was actually harder than obsidian and shark's tooth, they actually went after that. So um, unfortunately, they, they kind of stole some rowboats but they wanted the nail. They didn't steal it for the rowboat. You know, like I said, they could build you know, canoes that are twice as fast as rowboats. They wanted the metal nail because that helped the kapa makers put intricate designs into the Hawaiian kapa. And when you look at Hawaiian kapa with lighting in the back of it, you'll see these watermarks impressed into the, the kapa. That's significantly Hawaiian watermarking. And the intricate, intricate designs are what sets Hawaiian kapa apart from other parts of Polynesia. But that's another talk. I, but it kind of relates to what happened to Captain Cook. So um, mahalo, I'll take in, any questions you have. Um, thank, thank you very much for uh, having me here today.
the sandalwood trade started picking up, it really severely impacted the health of, of Canuck Valley. Uh, during this pre-sandalwood period, can you talk about the impact on health? Because they had to, uh, the men had to go way up in the forest and they had to live in the forest for a long time to do the work. Yeah. I, I can't speak to the, the collection part per se, but um, as I mentioned with the, the Peleliu fruit, oh. Could you repeat the question? Okay. The, the question was, um, what of the, the um, Hawaiian's health during this period of, of time and, and the impacts on the Hawaiian health as they're going into forest to, collecting, to collect these resources? Um, I can't speak to that specifically, but I will, what I will ta say is that Kamehameha didn't make it to Kauai because his men were sick from cholera. That's an introduced disease. So I would say the introduce, introduction of the foreigners and the diseases that were affecting the Hawaiian men had probably a greater impact. Um, of course, yes, they, they were away from uh, their families to collect um, woods, to, collect, to go up in the forest to collect koa. Um, but I don't know of any, anything, um, any reports of how of their health when they're going up in the forest, um, per se. I, I, I can only talk about, you know, the, the cholera outbreak that happened on, um, to his men and not being able to go, get to Kauai. Do you have anything? Do you know of anything in particular? Yeah, there's been uh, lots of reports about how severely they suffered in the cold. Okay. In the high, high so, the, yeah, the upper, air, upper um, parts of the forest are very cold, and if they weren't prepared, yeah, they could, you know, not freeze to death, but they'd definitely be colder than when they were living down in the more warm, dry, arid areas of Kauai High. Yeah, I can see that. As a counterpoint, though, I mean, the, the tradition of building Wahaua is an old one. And, and so if you look in the story of Cabello or others where they go up into the forest and people are pulling the canoes down, it's not like it was an unusual thing. It was something that happened, you know, occasionally whenever a chief needed, needed canoes. Uh, so it strikes me that Part of the protocols of that would be to be properly dressed and to anticipate how long you would be in there and, and to do all those things. So I don't know what they would have been a really significant out of the ordinary um, threat to the health of the people involved. So, so what I could say is, uh, yeah, thanks, thanks, Sam. So. I, I kind of agree that this is a long-standing tradition. They knew they know the areas where they're collecting koa and the temperatures of the forest there, so they would have been somewhat prepared. Um, I think what probably would have impacted them is that they probably didn't know that they were already affected by certain um, foreign diseases, and that would have had an effect on them if they went up to these areas. And then, and now being cold, um, could have had more of a detrimental effect on them. Um, so probably both both had a play. They introduced diseases along with going into these cold regions where they knew they have been and, and they've been going for generations. Yeah. Yes. Aloha. Aloha. Um, can you give sort of a summary or overview uh, of the effect of uh, uh, deforestation, say, from the sandalwood trade, for example, or the other uh, native trees on the island forests up to this point and any restoration efforts that might be happening? Um, so, so the question was about you know, impacts on, on the forest and, sand, and impacts by sandalwood trade and, and restoration efforts. Um, I'll briefly talk about this. This is the first time that someone's looked at um, impacts of the forest pre-ranching period. There are um, s reports by scientists that have looked at the degradation of the forest since um, ranching has, has occurred, especially on um, the Big Island, and also invasive grasses. And so we've lost more and more of our forest, especially the dry forest. And, and today, you know, we, we have a very, very small amount. It's estimated around you know, less than 10% of our dry forest left in, in Hawaii. Um, and that's due to fires and introduced grasses and ranching. Um, so that's the impact. Um, sandalwood, I, I'm not an expert in, in sandalwood, but the sandalwood trade did have an impact um, um, on the sandalwood uh, forest. Um, they, some of the forests probably were not dense uh, canopies, um, but there was probably definitely more of them than they are today. You still see some large sandalwood trees in the Kauai High area, um, but it's also covered with kikuyu grass because of the ranch that's been going on. Um, there's a lot of restoration efforts going on right now, especially in the North Kona area. The area of my study site, Ka'upulehu, there's actually a dedicated um, nonprofit that is actively restoring the dry forest there. 
Um, there are restoration efforts going on at Pu'uva'ava, just next, 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 next door, um, that they're restoring the dry forest there. And these are outplanting native dry forest trees as well as some of the endangered species. Um, so there are restoration efforts going on today. So if you look up, um, you know, restoration of Pu'uva'ava, Ka'upulehu, um, Waikoloa dry forest, these are three I can think of off the top of my head in this area that people are actively today going out and re restoring it, which is nice because we still have fires going on um, and, we're, and a lot of these trees are, are hard to propagate and, and grow and take a long time to grow. So the restoration is going to take, take a long time. Yeah, another question. So, to be clear, this is, you're talking about North Dakota and, and uh, South Dakota, but in fact the problem is throughout the islands, correct? Right? All the islands, say these forest and the um, I would, I, I'm, I'm probably focusing more where ranching has really affected the forest. So I would be, I would focus it mainly on Maui and Hawaii Island. Um, you, you know the famous ranches on, on both those islands. Well, those had an effect. Those were all once dry forests where you see Parker Ranch, Haleakala Ranch, Ulupalakua Ranch. Um, those are once, you know, really nice, dense dry forests, if not some, sometimes koa forests. Um, but they've been severely impacted by, by, by the, the cattle, unfortunately. What about Kaho'olawe? Huh? Kaho'olawe. Kaho'olawe um, was uh, not, uh, there was ranching that, that went on that probably had a significant effect. Um, the goats um, after the ranching had, had more in a, of an effect um, than, than probably the ranching practice. The ranching practices, I think for Kaho'olawe, um, was not as widespread when the, when the goats were left to run rampant on, on the island and eat everything. That, that's what really, I think, did a lot of the vegetation in for uh, Koho Olave. Sam, you, you had something? Oh, no, I want to point out that on Oahu, uh, ranching was probably a major effect of deforestation and the world of the James Campbell Estate, for example, uh, once they had the crisis of the state for example, once they called the crisis of 1900 and established the forest reserve. That's right. Uh, Thanks for reminding me. You're right. Yeah, Oahu did also have an, had its uh, showed its effects of ranching, and Sam points out the the, the arid lands of, of Eva, um, Waianae, um, and then Manoa. There's there's beautiful photos in I think it's the Manoa McDonald's showing you know s some of um, how Manoa used used to look like, um, and it, if not for the territorial foresters at the time spreading seeds from the airplane, we wouldn't have. It, although it's in, invasive, at least it's it's not. Eroding and um, uh, you know coming into you know um, our streams and and the like. Uh, so uh, the information handed down to them from Hawaiians generation after generation to be able to build the the Hale at Bishop Museum. Um, so that's been recorded for us. Um, so I think that's where some, you know, a lot of the information comes from is information that's been written and, and handed down and, and a lot of it coming from our kupuna. Um, some of them coming from foreigners who were able to make observations of when they encountered Hawaiians in the late 1700s. Yeah, another question. I'm not sure you're familiar with the largest war canoe in Polynesia that was made in Waitangi Oh, no, I'm not familiar with the largest canoe. So it's called the Wait Waitangi in Aotearoa? Yeah. Oh. No, I, I, I haven't. Um, maybe in, I'll, I'll make another plug. In June 2020, Hawaii will be hosting the Festival of the Pacific Arts in Honolulu, uh, predominantly in Honolulu. But we're gonna have 21 nations from the Pacific come to Honolulu. We'll have many of our Polynesian cousins coming, many by canoes. And so that might be a good time to interact with some of these other Polynesian Pacific Islanders and talk to them about canoe making. Um, I'll, I'll note that, I also like to highlight, you know, what makes it Hawaiian um, and different from other Polynesians. So I talked about kapa. Kapa is watermarked, has um, intricate um, designs in it. That's what makes Hawaiian kapa different from other Polynesian kapa. Um, the canoe, our Hawaiian canoes are dug out, okay? Other parts of Polynesia or Pacific, they actually take planks and they glue them together with um, the gum of the, the ulu. Um, so ours are not planked canoes, ours are uh, hewed out um, canoes. And also, you yeah, know, double, double hole. Um, so, but come uh, June 2020 and, and, and experience some of the other uh, traditions of the Pacific that are still you know, left, left uh, with us today and, and, and learn from them. Question, yeah. Um, 
all I can say is that I, I know there were Hawaiian women. There, there were um, um, Hawaiian warrior women as well as, you know, we, we used to think they were just all male, but we're finding out now that there were women. But that's all I, all I know. Sam, do you happen to know anything about Hawaiian uh, women, female yeah, warriors? Like, um, Brooke Parker has researched this a little bit. Brooke Parker. Were names of regiments that were specifically of, of women, and uh, they would do all kinds of, of things in the, on the battlefield that were different and yeah. integrated into the, into the strategies here. Yeah. But I think some of those are described uh, in, in like John Popeye, E.E. Okay, and, e. e. and, other, and other sources, okay. but, but only what I've read. Okay. So Pop, John Papa E.E. Brooks, Brooks Parker, you said? Brooke Parker. Brooke Parker. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yes. I think whoever talks about the, the new one of battle, they'll talk about the famous uh, Mahine uh, Koa named Manono. Manono. She was the oh, second okay. part of that one. Oh, battle of new one of Manono. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Raphael. Were you able to um, estimate how long it took him to put together the fleet? Um, he, you know, commitment being a, a, a high warrior, first of all, you need to have the money to be able to command your people to go collect the resources and, and put them together. Um, I think he was able to put, put together those, those 150 canoes in a short amount of time. A short amount of time is a couple years. Yeah. Because he had a lot of men working on it, and they were able to do it. And they had to do it kind of in a quick, quick amount of time because he, he wanted to, you know, get the other islands under his control. Yeah. But I, I, don't, I don't know anything specific. I'm just, you know, guessing. Yeah. What, what do you think of a theory that, that the big voyaging canoes stopped voyaging because they ran out of big trees? So what I think about stopping uh, Hawaiian voyaging stopping because of the lack of large trees? Um, possible. I never thought about that before. Um, I, I think Hawaiians had always been kind of adventurous. Um, you know, what, but I, I, I think only in, in more recent times, in like in the mid-1800s, where we actually started seeing more of a loss of those, those large trees. Um, perhaps the loss of how the protocols needed to cut down the trees probably had more of an effect rather than the resources. So yeah, thinking off the top of my head, I think it's not the resources that would have limited you know, the, the voyaging. It probably is the loss of the tradition the introduction of, introduction of diseases and, and Western Christianity and, and doing away with, you know, sort of that, those religious parts of, of you know, it was very religious, um, uh, uh, it, was, it was very religious to go into the forest and to cut down a, a koa tree. And if you were changing religions to a more Western religion, you're gonna try to forget that other part, the Hawaiian religion. So I think that had more of an effect. Yeah, good question though, yeah. Um, I don't know if Koa. Uh, are you talking about the company that, that is planting Koa? In, in, in yeah, so I know that there there is a, a company that is restoring Koa. You can go and, and and pay for a Koa tree and then have it dedicated to you. And then you know, in fifty or hundred, maybe fifty years, you can go back and and, and your your mo'opuna, your your grandkids can go see the tree that you you pay for and had planted. Um, so that is going on. Before that, though, Bishop Museum in, in the 80s really put a lot of their investment into growing koa. Um, and so uh, Bishop Estate, yeah, Kamehameha School's Bishop Estate had um, a lot of their lands dedicated to the restoration of koa. Um, so there has been a lot of restoration of koa. Um, I don't think it's necessary for um, extraction uh, that we're talking about here. It's, it's probably for more monetary extraction investment. Um, koa it, it pays a high price as far as... Um, you know, dollars per square foot. Um, look at if you've ever gone to Martin MacArthur. Um, so I think that's, that's, that's generally. But, you know, when, when they're planting those, those forests, other, other um, species come. And, you know, the, the forest birds, it's good for the forest birds. Um, sometimes the, the bat, the eo will, will come, and insects come on those, those koa trees. So it, it's, a, it's a good thing for the ecosystem. Um, you know, I, I may be, you know, not giving it great due because I consider it, you know, a plantation. It's essentially a core plantation that they're making, but they are still contributing to the general ecosystem. Yeah. Well, I'm very familiar with that. I, I was on the tree there. Oh, okay. They, they are for investment, some, but there's also a large portion that is just 
Yeah. yeah. That would be good because a lot of that land is, is ex ranch land, so planting it for um, just for future purposes and, and not wanting to be harvested at a later time, that that that's even better. Yeah. And the groups that I talked about in North Kona, you know, they're planting it for for future generations. Um, I always tell um, Hawaiian practitioners today, people who want to utilize you know these endangered hardwoods like the ui ui and the kawila for the weapons, I tell them that you know they're endangered now, and, and the way the Endangered Species Act work is until it's it's off the endangered species list, you know, we can't collect it, unfortunately. So what you can do is help restore the forest. You may not be able to extract it, but maybe your grandkids may be able to extract it. That's one. Two, look to a substitute species. And there are two that I always um, tell them about. One is ironwood. In its name, you know how hard it is, ironwood. So ironwood could be used for making weapons. And then two, uh, lignum vitae is another hardwood tree that's been traditionally used. Um, so, you know, they can use utilize substitute species if they still want to try to keep the tradition and see how their, um, their shark's teeth and their obsidian are able to, you know, carve out um, ironwood and, and, and lignavite before they use it on, you know, uhi uhi and, and kawila. You showed a gigantic koa tree with yeah. a little guy next to it. And then you said that in 20 years, you can, a koa tree is, seemed to me like it was got pretty big. That one was larger, yeah. yeah. That was more than 20 years. Yeah. Yeah, that was, that was a very large tree. Yeah. There was, there's, there was one, um, Sam, I think in, in the south corner of um, yeah, Emma the, area, right? The largest living core tree. Largest living core tree. How long? How, how, how long? You know, um, that was estimated at 450 years of age. 450 years of age. So it was there by like, you know. Yeah. So, and, and true to, you know, um, conservation ethic, which would have been um, implemented at the time, is that all the core trees were, were, were taken. You know, there were, there's protocols in choosing the right tree. So this tree, for whatever reason, was never chosen for, for koa by Kamehameha, and still alive today. Yes? Have you ever heard of Kamehameha issuing a kapu on a certain district, or uh, as, a, as a means of uh, forest management? It's forest management. I can't think of anything on hand. Can you think of anything, Sam, on, on uh, a couple uh, for forest management? Uh, in the middle of the sandalwood. Uh, the information handed down to him from Hawaiians generation after generation to be able to build the, the Hale at Bishop Museum. Um, so that's been recorded for us. Um, so I think that's where you know, a lot of the information comes from is information that's been written and, and handed down and, and a lot of it coming from our kupuna. Um, some of them coming from foreigners who were able to make observations of when they encountered Hawaiians in the late 1700s. Yeah, another question. I'm sure you're familiar with the largest war canoe in Polynesia that was made in the tanking after the war. Yeah. Uh, oh, no, I don't know. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah. But I think some of those are described um, in, in like John Popeye E.E. E. Okay, and, e. and, other, and other sources. Okay. But, but only what I've read. Okay. So Pop, John Popeye E.E. E. Brooks, Brooks Parker, are you saying? Brooks Parker. Brooks Parker. Is that artist, the, like the. Oh, okay. Of time. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yes. I think whoever talks about the, the new one of Babel, they'll talk about the famous Wahine uh, uh, named Manono. Manono. She was oh, okay. Oh, that of one in Manono. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Raphael. Were you able to um, estimate how long it took him to put together the fleet? Um, he, you know, Kamehameha being a, a, a high warrior, first of all, you needed to have the money to be able to command your people to go collect the resources and, and put them together. Um, I think he was able to put, put together those, those 150 canoes in a short amount of time. A short amount of time is a couple years. Yeah, because he had a lot of men working on it. And they were able to do it, and they had to do it kind of in a quick, quick amount of time because he he wanted to, you know, get the other islands under his control. Yeah, but I, I don't I don't think anything specific. I'm just you know guessing. Yeah. What, what do you think of the theory that that the big voyaging canoes stopped voyaging because they ran out of big trees? So what do I think about stopping uh, Hawaiian voyaging stopping because of the lack of large trees? Um, Possible. I never thought about that before. Um, I, I think Hawaiians had always been kind of adventurous, um, you know. But I, I, I think only in, in more recent times, in like in the eighteen mid eighteen hundreds, where we actually started seeing more of a loss of those those large trees. Um, perhaps the loss of how the protocols needed to cut down the trees probably had more of an effect rather than the resources. So, yeah, thinking off the top of my head, I think it's not the resources that would have limited, you know, the, the voyaging. It probably is a loss of the tradition, the introduction of, introduction of diseases and, and Western Christianity and, and doing away with, you know, sort of that, those religious parts of, of you know, it was very religious, um, uh, uh, it, was, it was very religious to go into the forest and to cut down a, a koa tree. And if you were changing religions to a more Western religion, you're going to try to forget that other part, the Hawaiian religion. So I think that had more of an effect. Good question, though. Yeah. I'm sure you're uh, familiar with the uh, large reforestation of Makoa that's going on in the northeast part of the island. And I was wondering what your comments uh, were uh, in respect to this history and the future of, uh, of this subject. Um, I don't know if Koa. Uh, are you talking about the company that, that is planting Koa in? in, in yeah, so I know that there, there is a, a company that is restoring koa. You can go and, and, and pay for a koa tree and then have it dedicated to you. And then, you know, in 50 or 100, maybe 50 years, you can go back and, and, and your, your mo'opuna, your, your grandkids can go see the tree that you, you paid for and had planted. Um, so that is going on. Before that, though, Bishop Museum in, in the 80s really put a lot of their investment into growing koa. Um, and so uh, Bishop Estate. Yeah, Kamehameha School's Bishop of State had um, a lot of their lands dedicated to the restoration of koa. Um, so there has been a lot of restoration of koa. Um, I don't think it's necessary for um, extraction uh, that we're talking about here. It's, it's probably for more monetary extraction, investment. Um, koa it, it pays a high price as far as um, you know, dollars per square foot. Um, look at if you've ever gone to Martin MacArthur. Um, so I think that's 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 generally. But you know, when, when they're planting those those forests, other other um, species come. And you know, the the forest birds is good for the forest birds. Um, sometimes the, the bat, the eo, will, will come, and insects come on those those koa trees. So it, it's a, it's a good thing for the ecosystem. Um, you know, I, I may be you know not giving it great due because because I consider it you know a plantation. It's essentially a koa plantation that they're making. But they are still contributing to the general ecosystem. Yeah. Oh, okay. And they are for investment, some, but there's also a large portion that is just going to be reforestation where they will not be yeah. continue That would be good because a lot of that land is, is ex ranch land, so planting it for um, just for future purposes and, and not wanting to be harvested at a later time, that, that, that's even better. Yeah. And the groups that I talked about in North Kona, you know, they're planting it for, for future generations. Um, I always tell um, Hawaiian practitioners today, people who want to utilize you know these 
endangered hardwoods like the Ui Ui and the Kawila for the weapons, I tell them that you know they're endangered now, and, and the way the Endangered Species Act work is until it's it's off the endangered species list, you know we can't collect it, unfortunately. So what you can do is help restore the forest. You may not be able to extract it, but maybe your grandkids may be able to extract it. That's one. Two, look to a substitute species. And there are two that I always um, tell them about. One is ironwood. In its name, you know how hard it is, ironwood. So ironwood could be used for making weapons. And then two, uh, lignum vitae is another hardwood tree that's been traditionally used. Um, so you know, they can use, utilize substitute species if they still want to try to keep the tradition and see how their um, their shark's teeth and their obsidian are able to, you know, carve out um, ironwood and, and, and lignum vitae before they use it on, you know, uhi uhi and, and kawila. You showed a gigantic koa tree with yeah. a little guy next to it. And then you said that in 20 years, you can have koa trees. It seemed to me like it was got pretty big. That one's larger, yeah. yeah. That was more than 20 years. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was, that was a very large tree, yeah. So. There was there's there was one um, Sam I think in in the South Kona um, yeah, Hema the area right. The largest living koa tree. Largest um, living koa tree. How long how 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 long? You know, um, that was estimated at four hundred fifty years of age. Four hundred fifty years of age. So it was there by like, Kobe. <laughs> yeah. So and and true to you know um, conservation ethic which would have been. Um, implemented at the time is not all the core trees were, were, were taken. You know, there were, there's protocols in choosing the right tree. So this tree, for whatever reason, was never chosen for, for koa by Kamehameha and still alive today. Yes? Have you ever heard of Kamehameha issuing a kapu on a certain district or um, as, a, as a means of uh, forest management? It's forest management. I can't think of anything on hand. Can you think of anything, Sam, on, on uh, a couple of four force men? Uh, in the middle of the Sandalwood era, where he, where he um, admonished against like, pulling up seedling Sandalwoods. Yeah. Uh, and he was, uh, the retort to him was, uh, you, will not, you will not benefit from these trees, so why are you concerned? And yeah. he said, it was for your children. Okay. Yeah. So he put out edict of not pulling up the Sandalwood saplings and saying it's not, it's not for you to take. Um, Kieran, I should have had you a- answer the, I just saw you, you should have answered the, the ranching question about a koho olave. No? Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, uh, could you say something about the process of converting a log into a canoe? The process of, of, of making it into a canoe. Um, I'm not a wood, wood maker, I'm only an ethnobotanist. Um, I, I was lucky enough, so the Hokule was built um, using man-made materials in a traditional manner. The Hawaii Loa was built with all natural materials in a traditional manner. And when Nainoa was looking for large enough koa trees, um, he couldn't find them in our forests. So he had known from accounts that logs from the Northwest would come to Hawaii sometimes. And so he went to the Northwest and asked the Native Americans there, could he look for some cedar logs large enough for the Hawaii Loa? And if he found them, could he take them? And there was a lot of uh, protocol done and those logs were eventually found, shipped to Hawaii and hewn and dug out at Bishop Museum um, in, in their triangular structure next, next to um, Atherton Halau. Um, so I think it was uh, Wright Bowman and, and his son spent um, quite a bit of time doing that. So I only ob- observed how it was done. He, he was using you know, modern materials to do it. it. Took him a long time, but it was really interesting to see that process and the public was invited. They could come down and, and watch it. Even some of you maybe even helped participate putting those canoes together. Um, but I don't know, know specifically. I think there are some books on, on, on that. Yeah, sorry. In Tommy Holmes' book, The Hawaiian Canoe, there is some description of that process. Tommy Holmes' book, The Hawaiian Canoe. Go to native books or, or your library. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Not. That's all. I brought some um, business cards here. Um, one last plug I'll say is that I'm a. Uh, I work with the Fish and Wildlife Service as an invasive species biologist, um, but I'm also president of the Oahu Council for the Association of Hawaiian Civic Clubs. Our our first club that we started um, in 1918, nearly 100 years ago, was by Prince Jonah Kuhio Kalaniana Ole. 
So we celebrated the centennial for the Hawaiian Civic of Honolulu last December. We're having um, an event at Bishop Museum March 23rd, a free event from noon to six, Bishop Museum will be free. It'll be sponsored by um, the Hawaiian Civic Club of Honolulu and the Oahu Council for the Hawaiian Civic Clubs. So please come, learn about Kuhio, learn about the Hawaiian Civic Club movement, um, and maybe that could be another topic of, of talks um, that you might want to talk about Prince Kuhio, and I, I have a, a PowerPoint all, all ready to go if you, if you, if you want. Um, so I, I have cards here from, as president of uh, Oahu Council of the Association of Hawaiian Civic Clubs, as well as my professional business card at Fish and Wildlife Service. It's been a pleasure talking to you today. Mahalo for inviting me. <laughs>